Well, we know people will keep dogs as pets. Um, case in point, me with this little fella here. Yeah. Um, people will keep cats, birds, fishes, and all sorts of furry, feathery, and scaly creatures as our companions. And in some cases, like me, our best friends and buddies in life. But I'm pretty sure that you've never heard about anyone keeping a dragon as a pet. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Apingo and I am the Chain Smoking Writer. Here we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people from the first creation myth to the last imperial dynasty. More than 6,000 years of stories, one video at a time. And if you would like to join us on this journey through time, remember to give a thumb to the video and a sub to the channel. And remember, click the bell icon so you'll be updated whenever a new video drops. And now, on to the story. I know, in the last episode, we spoke about the Shao Kang restoration and how the Xia royal family is restored to their rightful place. Uh, however, in this episode, we are going to skip forward quite a few generations. And today, we come to this king of the Xia dynasty named Kong Jia. Now, Kong Jia was the 14th king of the Xia dynasty and it was under his reign that the once glorious dynasty started its uh, irreversible decline. Uh, into self-destruction. Now, Kong Jia, well, he was known as a superstitious and eccentric uh, little wastrel who indulged in extravagances and had little time to for the more serious pursuits in life, such as, you know, learning about the affairs of state and looking out for the well-being of his people, you know, things like that. And you know, rather than taking after the diligent and uh, cautious kings that came after Shao Kang and the Restoration, one could say that he follows more into the footsteps of uh, the more indulgent ones like, you know, Tai Kang and, and um, the likes. Now, in fact, he was actually more outrageous and more feckless than any of the tyrants and the incompetent rulers of the early Xia dynasty. I mean, look at it this way, at least uh, people like Qi or Tai Kang actually had a bit of a shrewdness to them, I'm, even if we take into consideration the usurpers Han Zhuo and Hou Yi. They were at least shrewd and they schemed and maneuvered their ways to the top before uh, giving in totally to their indulgences. Whereas Kong Jia that we are going to talk about today, uh, yeah, he had none of that. He was just paddle to the metal, 120% indulgences, weirdness, superstitions, and eccentricity. And it was exactly for those reasons that his father, uh, the King Pu Xiang, decided to abdicate the throne to his own brother, King Jiong, rather than to leave the realms to in the hands of his own uh, useless son. Uh, so King Pu Xiang ascended to the throne at the age of 19 and the borders of the kingdom actually stretched to his furthest reaches under his rule. And um, he reigned for 59 years, which was basically known to be the longest and one of the most uh, stable reigns uh, and periods in the Xia dynasty. Now King Pu Xiang abdicated the throne to his own brother Jiong at the age of 78 to prevent... Uh, <laughs> the kingdom from being ruined in his son's uh, hands. And at the age of 88, 10 years after the abdication, he passed away and was buried in Lao Chiu, which is somewhere in today's uh, Henan Kaifeng. And when King Jiong later passed away, the throne went to Jiong's son, Jin. However, when King Jin passed away without an heir, the throne made its way back uh, to the hands of Kong Jia. Although Kong Jia's ascension to the throne was, I mean, come on, it was basically a series of fortuitous events and basically he outlived everyone. That's why he ascended to the throne. But uh, in his own mind, being the superstitious, eccentric that he is, he was, um, he firmly believed that it was his reward 
for being uh, pious and being diligent in all his uh, worships and his rituals, you know, in praying to all manners of ghosts and spirits and deities that, and what have you. And in turn, this kind of made him even more superstitious and even more eccentric and, uh, you know, even more set in his beliefs that the deities were taking care of him and were looking out for him, you know. He was the chosen one. He was blessed by the spirits and all that, all that jazz, you know. Now, Kong Jia ruled for a total of 31 years. And in his 31-year reign, Kong Jia totally ignored all affairs of states, okay. He let the realm go unattended. Floods and droughts destroyed the farmlands. Famines decimated his people and the local leaders, the local tribal chiefs, broke away from the central court to govern their own lands uh, autonomously. They basically just stopped uh, following the orders of the central court. I mean, the central court basically ignored them to begin with. So yeah, they broke away and since the central government is not going to do anything for their lands, they are just going to have to... Uh, take care of their own people and their own lands themselves and thus, you know, slowly and uh, over time these uh, local regional leaders broke away from uh, central command. Now, while the realm was falling to pieces and the royal treasury was, you know, slowly getting depleted, Kong Tia basically remained oblivious to all the sufferings that were going on outside his palace walls. And he was unconcerned about, you know, regional chiefs getting more powerful by the day and, you know, ignoring the command from the, and the directions from the central government. Uh, because all he cared about were his wine, his harem, his music, and of course, his uh, superstitious uh, worships and rituals. Well, at least he's not into hunts. Now, one day during his reign, a servant or a, an attendant ran into King Kong Jia's palace and reported that a pair of dragons had, you know, descended from the heavens and landed in uh, the Yellow River and the Han River. Now, the aesthetic king felt that it must be a sign from the gods, you know, it must be a reward from the heavens for his outstanding rule of the people. And so, he ordered his men to capture the dragons and keep them in uh, two giant pools. Uh, which he ordered to be built specifically on palace grounds to house these dragons. Now, however, because dragons has not been sighted in the mortal realm for such a long time, uh, nobody knew anything about dragons and how to keep them and how to take care of them. So Kong Jia sent out his men to scour the land for you know anyone who knew anything about dragons, and he was offering great rewards for anyone who would you know take care of his precious pets. Now it was said that during the times of the great sage kings uh, Yao and Shun, there was a clan known as the Huanlong clan, who were the royal dragon keepers of the sage kings at that time. And the skills of dragon keeping were actually passed down through the generations uh, to the, the, the present day at that time. And so uh, somehow King Kong Jia's men found a descendant of the Huanlong clan, uh, this man by the name of Liu Lei. And it was said that Liu Lei actually had this uh, full knowledge of his ancestors' uh, skills. So they invited Liu Lei to the imperial court and... Um, Kong Jia, you know, immediately appointed him uh, the, to the position of royal dragon keeper and even uh, revoked the fiefdom of Zhu Rong's uh, descendants to give it to Liu Lei. Now, Liu Lei might be a descendant of the Huanlong clan. He's really a descendant of the Huanlong clan. However, he had little to no knowledge about dragons and how to keep them alive and I mean, he might be diligent and conscientious in carrying out his duty. I mean, he was like, you know, he's like that colleague you have in your office that's always, you know, keeping his head down, not causing any trouble, just doing what he's supposed to do. Yeah, Liu Lei is kind of like that kind of person. Um, but, I mean, let's face it, he was stuck in an impossible position. I mean... Uh, it is not by any stretch of imagination that disaster will strike sooner or later. 
Now the two dragons that Kong Jia had in his possession were actually one male and one female. And you know, in an accident due to mishandling, uh, the female dragon died. And you can imagine how terrified Liu Lei was. I mean, he was fearing for his life if the king should ever find out what happened. So um, in a series of very bad decisions, I would say, um, Liu Lei actually minced up the dead dragon's meat and made meat patties. Yeah, again, meat patties, but this is dragon patties. So he made meat patties out of the minced up female dragon and he offered it to the king as a delicacy. Now, Kong Jia ate the mysterious meat, not knowing what it was, and uh, he actually found them to be extremely delicious. And, you know, after he had it, he was like, oh, this is good, I, I, I must have more, you know. And so he sent his men to ask Liu Lei for more of this delicious meat. Uh, however, when they arrived at Liu Lei's uh, residence, they found that he had already escaped with his en entire family. And, you know, uh, they later, you know, dug deeper and they discovered what happened. They discovered that uh, the female dragon had died because of uh, mishandling and uh, it was made into a meat patty and served to the king. So Kok Chia, of course, he was furious and, you know, and, and, and since he, they could not find uh, this despicable offender, this, this uh, criminal, and Kong Chia being Kong Chia, you know, after a while, after being angry for a while and furious for a while, he just like, ah, it is what it is. So he just let the matter go and turn his attention to the more um, serious issue of uh, seeking out a new dragon keeper. And this time, they actually found someone with real skills in dealing with dragons, real skills and real knowledge of dragons. And um, this fellow was named Shiman. Now, Shiman was renowned throughout the land for his magical abilities to manipulate fire. I mean, he could eat fire, he could walk on fire, he could even jump into roaring flames without getting burnt. Now, under his uh, attentive care, the male dragon uh, soon regained his vigor, started eating again, and started swimming and frolicking in his pool. And of course, the king, uh, Kong Jia, was extremely pleased with the results that Shiman was able to produce. Uh, but he was not so keen on the man himself. I mean, um, let's put it this way. You know about all those uh, eccentric geniuses, the grumpy geniuses who, who, who always think they are right and couldn't stand fools. Yeah, Shiman was a man like that. Uh, he was a temperamental man with a very strong, uh, stubborn streak and he hated, hated, absolutely detested uh, having people interfering with his work and his... Uh, his uh, uh, mission and he did not take kindly to fools no matter who, who they think they were. He did not take kindly to fools who assume to be more capable than they are or than he was. Now, it was not difficult to see that an eccentric king and an eccentric and stubborn dragon keeper was a match made in hell. And um, of course, they have frequent arguments, you know, heated arguments over the way the dragon was being cared for. And, and in one particularly heated argument, Simon, you know, being who he is, called the king an idiot right to his face and um, told him basically in, in, in simple terms that he obviously had no idea what he was talking about and but still insisted on giving orders that were ridiculous and nonsensical and did not make any sense at all. Okay, I guess we can all agree that it would not end well for Simon after that outburst. So, uh, the king, in the heat of his anger and his rage, ordered the immediate execution of Simon. And um, he even gave the order that Simon was not to be buried and not to give, be given a proper funeral. Instead, his decapitated body was to be dumped in a wilds outside the city. Now, it was said that at the very moment 
that Shimon's body was dumped into the ditch, a fierce wind rose and thunder roared and lightning streaked across the dark sky ominously, and a storm such as none has ever seen before swept across the land and beat mercilessly upon the land. And so much rain fell in that storm, that one storm, that three feet of water accumulated across the entire realm. And of course, that would uh, flood the the dragon pool in the palace. And so the dragon that was in the pool escaped from the pool and it was said that it uh, flew up into the skies and returned to the heavenly realms. Now once the rain and the storm you know, ceased, ceased and stopped, a fierce fire raged across all the forests and the mountains around the capital city. Now this great fire burns everything to cinders for miles around for as far as the eyes can see. And all one could see after the fire died down, all one could see from the capital was a burnt out landscape. And all they could smell was smoke and soot. Now learning about all this devastation that was happening outside the palace walls, I mean for once Kong Jia was not oblivious to what happened outside the palace walls and once he heard what happened and he found out what happened, uh, the terrified king, I mean being the superstitious uh, eccentric that he was, the terrified king was convinced with, with no shadow of a doubt, he was totally convinced that it was the spirit of Shimon you know, coming back to seek vengeance for his death. And so, as the superstitious man that he was, he immediately ordered rich offerings to be prepared and he would personally travel to the location where Simon's body was being disposed of. He would travel there personally to pray for forgiveness and for, for, for uh, mercy, you know, by offering up all these offerings and um, trying to make amends for what he did. Now, um, they made the trip there. Uh, Kong Jia made the offerings, prayed for forgiveness. And after all the worship and the rituals were done, Kong Jia, you know, got into his royal carriage for the return trip. Now, when they arrived at, back at the palace complex, the guards were pretty perplexed uh, when the king did not exit from the the. the, the the carriage and after some deliberations a particularly brave guard from the regiment uh, decided to you know check on the king and see if everything was all right i mean him being eccentric and all he could be just up to one of his strange uh, moods you know so one of the guards decided to check on the carriage check on the king uh, risking his life risking death um, and when he looked in, they found that Kong Jia had already died in the carriage on the way back. Now, although we said that Kong Jia kept two dragons in his uh, palace complex uh, in big, deep pools built specifically for them, uh, it is more probable and definitely more possible that uh, they were actually just big, giant fishes. Um, kind of similar to the ones you find in the Amazons. I think they were, they were called the uh, Aeropimas. And uh, if you know anything about the Chinese, uh, we Chinese people, we actually like this uh, uh, fish, this ornamental fish called the uh, Aeropimas. You might have heard of them before. And they are, the Chinese name for Aeropimas is actually Long Yu, which means dragonfish, because of the two whiskers sticking out of the nose and the shape of the face. So I believe, and there are some um, theories floating around that say that the Kong Jia's dragons were actually a, a kind of an ancient breed of arowanas or aeropimas. You know, these fishes can grow up to like 8, 10, 12 feet long and they do kind of look a bit dragonish. So yeah, um, it's probable that he had two great giant aeropimas in his palace and uh, being the superstitious man and the boisterous and um, a person who kind of exaggerates a lot, he would have told the entire land that he got two dragons uh, in a way to make himself feel good. And of course, uh, it also serves a purpose for propaganda 
that oh look your king has got dragons the 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 heavens must love your king so much that they rewarded him with two dragons however his 31 years of ridiculous and uh, indulgent um, behavior has already pushed the kingdom the dynasty to its brink and there's no coming back from that i mean seriously um, no amount of propaganda and no amount of feel good stories is going to save the kingdom by the end of Kong Jia's 31 year reign. In fact, um, it will be just uh, four short generations or just four more kings after Kong Jia before the entire Xia dynasty and the Xia kingdom will be totally and irrevocably wiped off the face of the earth and be taken over by a new subsequent royal house and dynasty now i hope you enjoyed the story as much as i enjoyed telling it i mean here are some factless superstitious eccentric dooming the entire kingdom to its demise what's new anyways uh if you do like the story and the video uh remember give a thumb to the video and a sub to the channel and remember to click on the bell icon to be notified whenever a new um video drops and if you are considering and if you can afford to support the channel on patreon the links are available here and down in the description box together with links to my other social media platforms and as usual i look forward to all your comments and i do enjoy the banter that we have down there and i do enjoy learning some things that i do not yet know in the comment section so yeah go ahead Leave your comments, tell me something I don't know, say something to me. I do personally go through all of them and I do reply to them whenever possible, usually all of them. So yeah, I guess that's it for today and I will see you in the next episode. <laughs>